Dr. Bless, you had a near-death experience when you were 20 years old. How did it come about? Well, I was out and about with my father in his car. He was at the wheel, and we were driving home. It was a long drive on a Friday evening, and it was already dark. And the last thing I remember him saying was, I still have to fill up the gas tank. And there was a gas station outside our village, and he had to cross the street. He parked in the forecourt, and when he was about to get out, a car came toward us at great speed from the opposite side. And because of a brief confusion on the part of the driver, it very quickly and with full force hit our car from the side, right on the passenger side where I was sitting. The impacting car was thrown 300 meters onto a meadow opposite in the car sat three young men, members of a racing club, but most of them got off with a bad fright. One of them had a broken leg, but our car was catapulted over an iron fence into a garden, whereby a really tremendous bang was to be heard, and there the car came to a stop. But I did not feel anything more uh, of that. Instead, I immediately saw into unconsciousness during the collision. And when I woke up, I found myself on a kind of strangely high level of consciousness. A feeling of dying was permeating me. It was inconceivable for me that I should die. But this feeling was so pervasive, it was a solemn feeling indeed, an intense feeling that was permeating me, and that also amazed me. Because up to now, it was always only the others that had to die. And at this young age, I hadn't expected that sometime it would be my turn to die, and certainly not at the present moment. But so it was, clearly, and then I felt myself as if I was cut away fiber by fiber from what I was closely connected to thus being detached from people, from things, from all of my close connections to the world. In the end, my life hung by a thread that was getting thinner and thinner. I was still frantically thinking about how I could ever get into this situation that I was going to die now, and I heard a piercing, booming noise. So I was dying, and purely logically, I concluded that an accident must have been the reason for this. I could still remember, indeed, my father wanting to refuel, but soon I was no longer interested in the causes of this condition. Instead, a tremendous process was initiated that completely fascinated and absorbed me. I got caught in a maelstrom, a kind of vortex for spraying sparks, and I was drawn into a suction that carried me away in a similar way like a rising river. There was nothing that could be done against it. This suction tore me away, and then I was pulled through a dark and narrow tunnel. But that didn't take for long, and I came out on the other side of the tunnel, but inside the tunnel I heard a booming noise, similar to the sound of bells, but disharmonious. And on the other hand, I suddenly felt completely free and light. And much to my astonishment, I saw myself from above lying in a strawberry patch. At first, I couldn't figure out why in a strawberry patch. And at the time, it was the month of June, and later on, I was able to find the proof that it really was a strawberry patch with ripe strawberries, and so I saw myself lying there, lifeless, and was sure that this was clearly me, because this human being lying down there was wearing a green top, a unique piece that my mother had sewn. And I was a little surprised 
why I was lying in a strawberry patch. And I noticed people rushing by, completely shocked. And of course, this accident had caused a terrible bang. So people were quite hectic and horrified. And this was quite an uncomfortable situation. And then I noticed that I could just float away, what I also liked to do. But right away, there was something new again I was faced with. Namely, suddenly my whole life was running before me again at dizzying speed. I relieved my whole life again, as in a time lapse, through all stations, from the earliest childhood, with all smells and sounds and sensations and thoughts. It was incredibly fascinating to relive the whole of life so quickly, so vividly, as in a three-dimensional film. And this additionally with a lot of other things, the smells and so on. And so I began to gain an insight into the essence of life at that moment, thereby realizing that the life in our world is comparable to a bobsled running when you don't look either to the left or to the right. You grope your way through the world in blindness, thus forfeiting all sense-giving happenings, and at that moment the connections were suddenly clear to me in a way that I never would have expected them in my earthly life. The symbol for a worldview came to mind. I had a girlfriend who created worldviews. They have tangled threads at the back and a beautiful picture in front. And that's exactly how it felt to me at that moment. Because when we are part of life, we sometimes are confronted with tangled threads that we cannot necessarily figure out. But now, all of a sudden, I saw the threads on the front of the picture. And this was a picture that was beautiful. And it did make sense. And this made me particularly happy. Because before, the question of the sense of life had concerned me quite a bit, and now I suddenly could understand that life has a meaning in itself. You don't have to ask about it anymore. Life has a meaning. And going through my life review, it happened almost by itself that I carried out an evaluation. So I think that every human being has a kind of general guide. And so I felt that what matters is the innermost motivation, the innermost motive of our action and our thinking, but our non-action as well, and the innermost motive, that is love, is an incredibly strong force. And looking back on my life, I also realized that I had been loveless now and then. But also, my acting lo lovingly now and then, I saw that every thought we have, every feeling, everything characterizing us, is being sent out by us in the form of waves. And this then triggers joy or sadness around us. I indeed have regretted a few episodes of them because I saw that I made this or that person sad with something, but I also made people happy with something. All I want is that we are connected with everything that is around us, with all people, and as strongly with everything that is around us, with all animals, with nature, with the whole cosmos. I had the feeling that I am part of the whole vast cosmos and that I am in inner resonance with it. Also, that I cannot separate myself from it because I am a part of the whole and with it I am connected to everything and also that everything is connected to everything. And so I became very aware of this then, but all of this was not just a painful self-judgment, because in this life review, I was also able to slip into everyone around me, thereby absorbing their feelings. And as I said, the whole thing was not some terribly painful self-judgment. Self it was just simply that the eyes are being opened for a deeper truth.
that was embedded in a forgiving and generous understanding. May I come back to the tunnel experience? When you came out of the tunnel, did you then hover over yourself? <clears throat> yes, the tunnel was the way. And then I was in a way just simply outside, just simply anywhere up there. Did you experience the life review you described while you were still in the tunnel? No, no, afterwards. Afterwards, I then saw myself from above and was amazed and thereby perceiving the hecticness of people and their fright. I wanted to secretly steal away when I unexpectedly was struck by this life review, although I have to say that some of the time sequence of these episodes can perhaps be interchanged a bit, because everything happened simultaneously, so to speak. But the way I remember, it was that I first saw me from above, and then I saw the life review. You also have interpreted a wonderful worldview out of the woven picture of your girlfriend, and you said that you have understood the meaning of life from it. What insights did you gain from it? I understood that there is a meaning in life itself, but as for me, it had tormented me, and that's why I studied philosophy. But, well, ultimately, it's not mandatory to ask yourself this question, because the question about the sense of life becomes obvious by life itself. Strangely enough, I can't answer what the meaning of life is. I can just say, it is life. Dr. Bless, when you were hovering over yourself, observing the whole situation, could you then also get a glimpse into the spiritual domain? Yes, that followed my preceding impressions, and immediately after the film of life, I met shining figures, and as they got closer to me, I saw that they all were acquaintances, and they also seemed to be distant relatives. Although back then, only one person of, of my more immediate environment had died, and that was my grandmother shortly before, and she was exactly the one whom I saw right in the front. And now there she was, such a wonderful appearance, radiating great happiness and also appearing healthy and youthful. Considering that she had died miserably of cancer a year earlier, so that my mother had taken her to our home in order to care for her, and her protracted debilitation process, her pain and her death had depressed me tremendously. I couldn't figure out what death was. I thought that death might just be a black hole to fall into, or just pure nothingness. I was mourning her very much, and that's why death itself had really scared me. So for half a year, a constant ulterior motive for me was the question of what is death? And just thinking about it, a feeling of oppression came over me. And now that I saw her so full of happiness and radiant and shining, I since have never mourned her. And I was so happy to see her, knowing now that she's doing better there than ever before, that it's all just wonderful, and she is in touch with me, and we were exchanging a ping-pong game of thoughts. The mouth was certainly no longer active, but we could understand each other's thoughts, and so she welcomed me, so to speak, and although I wasn't afraid, she made every effort to show me an even friendlier uh, interpretation or access into the hereafter. And I was very happy to see that. And it wasn't until later in the hospital when I tried again to visualize who all these people were that I had seen there, I realized 
that they had all been deceased, deceased neighbors and so on, including people I hadn't known, but who seemed to be very close to me, probably relatives whom I had never even seen. And in that moment, I remembered everything. I had heard about death until then, and now I had only a, a weary smile for such belief, because what I was experiencing was completely different from how I had imagined it based on all the stories, because at that time nothing was known about near-death experiences. Moreover, death was considered to be something terrifying, and at that moment I considered it a great privilege to be able to leave this world at such a young age, and finally life is also a, a little hardship every day, along with with all the joys, and now I felt no regret at all that I was able to exchange life so early for this fantastic being there in this new, new dimension, because that was indeed a new dimension. More and more, shall we say, my mind awoke to unexpected abilities. Detached from the fetters of the body, my awareness swung itself up to a multi-dimensionality that one cannot even imagine here on Earth. I could think many clear, crystal clear, deep trains of thought simultaneously, and many questions were arising from inside of me. And when going through this situation, I had a quick flash of inspiration. If only I had been able to do this before at school, solving 20 math problems at the same time. And that's roughly how it felt for me. Then a lot of questions kept coming to my mind and comparable with Zoom techniques. Wherever a question led, I already had been there before because there were no local or time restrictions. I also was interested in how the universe is structured, and that is something that I have always been interested in. But now I was particularly keen on knowing that, namely in its smallest particles, and I suddenly understood the entire atomic physics at that same instant. And then it occurred to me that I would always have liked to see the Andromeda Nebula, simply because of its beautiful name, and, well, also because it appears in literature, although it is a very distant Milky Way system, but at the same time I saw the Andromeda Nebula, there were no barriers for me on Earth either. So I thought that I could now go cheaply to Australia, which has always, it's always been my desire to travel to Australia, but at the time the airfares were still very expensive. That was beyond the affordable, and really all of a sudden, I was in Australia. I even think that I saw a kangaroo. And also the time course was just wonderful. It was possible in terms of time to have a look either back or ahead. However, I don't remember future events. But I have in memory that I was able to look into the past for a moment. Above all, I was interested in what it all looked like in the era, era of the ancient Romans. And in a twinkling of an eye, I saw it. And that was incredibly fascinating. This constant expanding knowledge that no longer has any limits, that was so fantastic, because with this expansion of the mind, I was simultaneously overwhelmed more and more by the deepest feelings, feelings of peace, of harmony, of incredible happiness. And then I realized that all of this actually was were only accompanying circumstances for the greatest thing that was to come now. I suddenly realized again that I was actually still in the rising river, into which I had felt drawn from the beginning. This raging river that simply pulled me along, and now I saw the destination of this river,
And this was an incredible light, like a sun shining brightly in its powerful sunrise, glistening bright, but it didn't hurt the eyes. A wonderful shining, beautiful light, which, however, was not only light, but was moreover radiating an unimaginable warm love, a personal love. For me, this light was the epitome of the absolute, of the good, of knowledge, of wisdom, of love. And it was so powerful, it actually pulsated out of an energy, a creativity, and also out of an overflowing unconditional love and that's what touched me tremendously I will never be able to say or express adequately what this moment was for me I was inflamed maybe also in ecstasy and I was burning with longing to immerse into this wonderful light into this ocean of love that's all I wanted it was indescribable exhilarating this experience of love of light to get to a better understanding of what you said about being being in this rising river that carried you away to the light, how has this been shown to you? It rose like a big sun, and it was just in front of me, a fantastic light that attracted me, not only visually, but also emotionally, and it exuded such an ineffable love, but was also conveying knowledge, energy, creative power, everything, it was absolute, so that it was clearly perceptible for me, that's the goal, and I only had a short distance still to cover, and a feeling overcame me, like I am approaching now a threshold, and there I can immerse into this light, or maybe get closer to it. But just at that moment, the further experiencing in these worlds of the good stopped suddenly, and I heard a word that entered my consciousness, and that seemed to me to be a million years away, and yet it was my name. I was so amazed, my name. I was gone a long time before, but this. Then I realized that it was my father who was calling my name. I felt panic in his voice, utmost despair. Fear. He was calling again and again, Magdalene, Magdalene, Magdalene. And only in special situations did he call me like that. Usually, I had a nickname at home, and as if by magic, I listened when I heard this name. I had been raised to do this all my life, and later on, I then was told by some physicians that the ear is the last sense organ that sort of remains intact during the process of dying, at least for longer than the other senses. However, I heard my father calling my name, but I could not see him. And I was, well, I suddenly got into a dilemma. I felt his fear. I felt so sorry for him, and I wanted to tell him, it's so nice here. He really panicked, because after a while they found me in this destroyed car, and I was under a seat where I sat in the back of the car, I, I had slipped under a seat, whereas he had got out of the car and not seeing me, first off assumed that I had already got out until he realized that this wasn't the case. However, the helpers came who had heard this bang and somehow I was pulled out of the damaged car and laid on this garden bed and at that moment, I was completely lifeless. I had no more pulse, no more breath, and was totally pallid. And the people said, she's dead. And my father, as if from his instinct, thought, how should he communicate all this to my mother at home? I'm the only daughter besides three brothers, and it was so terrible for him. 
And in his panic, he just kept shouting my name. And maybe in doing so, he did the best he could in this situation, even though maybe somehow quite unconsciously, he too really thought that I was dead. And I still wanted to say to him, let me go. It's beautiful here. I want to stay here. There's no comparison at all between the life over there with life here on Earth. And if you knew that I'm doing so well here and that I'm so happy, then you would let me go for sure. That's what I wanted to tell him. But I couldn't. Between him and me, there was something like a wall. So I realized that I can't tell him anything. I didn't see him either. I just heard him. But apart from that, there was an impenetrable wall between us. And considering this, I got into a dilemma. When imagining that my funeral would be in a few days, and then everyone would cry, because that's what people used to do when, the, when a young person has died. So I felt sorry for my relatives, because I wanted them to know that I was fine, but how should they know it? So what should I do now? Wasn't it cowardly if I thus fell into this happiness and the family would be crying afterwards? Who knows for how long? So I really got into a dilemma. And then I thought about trying once again in order to see if I can return again. Because there where I was now, I'd come back anyway. And then, at least, I had tried to return, whether I succeeded or not, but in doing so, I at least would have tried, and in both cases, I would have won. However, with all my strength, with concentrated strength and fortitude, which I was disposing of at this moment anyway, I turned against the flow of this river, and then I reached for a moment of vertex, thereby realizing that this was an important moment, namely the decisive moment for the one side or the other. And this was only for one moment, and it was incredibly exciting. And as you can see, I fell to the earthly side. And this meant really a fall, like falling down from great heights. And all these lucid trains of thought that I still had just now were blurred. And this wonderfully glowing light of love that had so fascinated me had gone out and the thought process became more and more confused and were put into a dark, flat, dim state. And then I felt a jolt and realized, ah, now I'm back in my body. As a matter of fact, I had completely forgotten my body in the meantime, but now I could feel it again with all of my senses, especially its heaviness. We are constantly carrying so much weight around with us. Normally, you aren't aware of it, but at that moment, of course, I felt the weight. And of course, I also felt some pain, but what horrified me most was the shadowy, dim, one-dimensional thinking that we have here. All the power of knowledge was over. And then it was clear to me that from now on, I had to live on only with this little bit of thinking and feeling. The whole great glow being gone, and I was so disappointed at that moment that I simply plunged into unconsciousness again but without inward experience. And after a while, when coming to my senses, I found myself lying in a rocking vehicle, and a friendly person who was doing his duty and who saw that I was waking up uh, asked me, what's your name? And what health insurance do you belong to? And then I really had to laugh. The earth had me back. How bad were your injuries in that car accident? 
Well, I had a lot of fractures from top to bottom of my body, from a skull fracture to three pelvic fractures, and a lot of bruises and muscle tears. My eyes were full of glass splinters, but actually, the most dangerous thing was a contusion, or how shall I put it, a contusion of my kidneys, because back then, the cars had a kind of armrest on both sides of the rear seats, and that's why today, cars are no longer equipped with that, and because from the right where I was sitting, this other car crashed into it with full force. So these armrests hit my kidney area, and that, I think, caused a body shock. Because when you are young, you can survive a lot of physical injuries, fractures, and external wounds and all that, but everything heals again. But the dangerous thing was this shock by which some of my inner organs were just cut off from any further supply. And the countershock came from my father, but I was still in a critical state for three to four days because some psychological processes were no longer working, but thereupon everything gradually returned to normal. Well, it was primarily this body shock that was life-threatening, and then your recovery was progressing well. Yes, but it actually took a few months. Um, that in any case, several months, but then it went well again, of course. What impact did this near-death experience have on your future life? Well, in the first moment when I got to the hospital, where I was staying for quite a long time, I was incredibly euphoric, even though the outer conditions did not suggest this. But still, the first disappointment was overcome very quickly, and I considered it a, a tremendous gift to be able to live again without this constant fear in the background. What does it mean to be dead? Where do we go? And so on. And this is a fear probably entailing even more fears. And this fear was gone. And I was so happy about this gift of life that for weeks I had been euphoric, so happy, so cheerful, that the people who came to visit me used to ask me, have you been given morphine or what's on with you? But of course, this was not the case. I just was very happy. And I was accommodated in a six-bed room in the hospital, and people constantly had been brought into my room, uh, those who had attempted suicide, because I was someone who considered life to be so beautiful. So this insight has really remained with me, namely that life is a tremendous gift, a gift that cannot at all be taken for granted, with all its ups and downs that are brought about by life. But after each depth, there are highs again. And all in all, life is a tremendous gift, and it fills me with great awe and with great respect. I'd say that I do not know how I would have developed without this experience, but as a whole, I have to say that afterwards, I had more intensive relationships, for example, with nature, with plants, or with nature in general, and with what happens in nature, and I was also more affectionate toward life and life fulfills me with an incredible awe. I always look at it anew as a miracle, and this same fear of death is gone. On the contrary, in secret, I feel a pleasant anticipation of death because the prelude was so wonderful that the concert to follow someday will be even more beautiful. Well, of course, then earthly life gradually became more and more easy to bear. I don't think about my near-death experience every day, but yet for me, it is an inner consolation in all situations in life when recapitulating that 
because then I felt happy. And what has possibly been sharpened by this is a certain intuition, maybe also a more distinct empathy into other people that I did not have before to this extent, also a feeling that we all belong together, that we are interwoven with everything, with the whole universe, with the whole humanity, with everything. And furthermore, I now have some interests that are very pronounced in me. Although I then became an historian, I studied history, but nevertheless, natural sciences and above all, quantum physics have always been of great interest to me. Quantum physics and philosophy are related areas of frontier sciences docking at each other, one field of this science merging into the other, and that fascinates me immensely. Because I think with models like this, one can better decipher the mystery of the universe. Maybe never completely, yet I'm simply interested in it. And also in astronomy, for example. And what has also remained is a strong interest in mysticism namely in the great old mystics, as they are known by Christianity and also by Islam, as is Hildegard von Bingen and Rumi. These are the authors I have intensively read, but also other authors, because I think that I sometimes discover texts in mysticism that are very similar to a near-death experience. And I think the mystics have experienced experienced something similar. This brief merging with their divine core, and that's what it's all about, mysticism is the secret stream that feeds all religions, the major religions, and these are the interests having remained in my mind, probably being reinforced by this, this experience, but also the feeling of having responsibility for each other. And, um, but yet, I'm therefore not a perfect person. A human is just only a human. You had this near-death experience in 1968. Was it already known at that time that such near-death experiences existed? No, not really, not at that time, and not in a wider range. I, at any rate, had never heard of it back then. So I then realized that I couldn't tell anyone about it, even though first I tried by saying to the people in the hospital, I died and now I'm back. But they waved it off by means of the words, yes, yes, it's okay, you'll be all right. But nobody took it seriously. But then I felt that no one understood what I wanted to make them understand. And no one was interested in it either. They probably thought that I was somehow mentally confused or something like that, whereupon I didn't tell anyone for years. But I immediately wrote this experience down after a few days in a large notebook when I was still in hospital. I still have this notebook so that I will never forget anything of it because I knew that this was the top experience of my life. But at the moment, I couldn't tell anyone because I have the impression that no one is open to it. And so it has been going for years. And I also had thoughts as regards people who would be laughing about this or not taking it seriously if I told of it and what would hurt me because this experience is so precious to me that I just kept it to myself now because I'm afraid that otherwise people would consider me a bit crazy. But then, seven years later, this first book by Raymond Moody was launched, who was the first to collect near-death experiences with a whole series of examples, and who had shed light on the subject for the first time. 
There were indeed already a few books before. One author of them just comes to my mind, a certain author who could formulate this well. He was a psychiatrist, and his book is titled Longing for Over There, or something like that. And he had already written this book uh, on this topic shortly beforehand, but it was not as widely known as Moody's book, which then immediately was translated into many languages and had a media echo. And soon many books on the subject were launched. And now there's a lot of books and research on this topic. But this book by Moody broke the spell. And this relieved me indeed when realizing that this is not my own personal and individual experience, but that it's a general human experience that people in this near-death situation can have if they remember it, and that ever runs according to a certain scheme. Maybe this element or that is missing sometimes, but all in all, these experiences are amazingly similar, and it relieved me a lot being aware of this, because I then felt that I myself wasn't crazy to that extent, but rather that I had gone through a general human experience, whereupon I was also able to relate it when asked about it. Dr. Bless, a very big thanks for the interview.